Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're joining us again on Writer's Chat. My name is Johnny Alexander. I'm here with my co-hosts, Brandy Bro and Melissa Stroh. And we're just really glad to have you here, whether you're here in the community live or whether you're watching the replay, we just welcome you. And I'm gonna quickly just shoot it over to Melissa so that she can introduce our very special guest. Well, thank you. And I am honored today to introduce you to uh, James L. Rubart. You may not know this, but James L. Rubart is a 28-year-old trapped inside an older man's body. <laughs> Thinks he's still young enough to water ski like a madman and dirt bike with his two grown sons. He's the best-selling Christie Hall of Fame author of 16 novels and loves to send readers on mind-bending spiritual journeys they'll remember months after they finish one of his stories. He's also a branding expert, audiobook narrator, and co-founder with his son, Taylor, of the Rubart Writing Academy. He lives with his amazing wife on a small lake in Eastern Washington, and today he's come to talk to us about audiobooks. So welcome back, Jim. Yeah, thank you for having me, having me back. <clears throat> Good to be here. Well, I think we're just going to turn it over to you and hear what you have to tell us about um, just the boom of audiobooks in recent years and how we might take advantage of that in our own writing and our own careers. Yeah, for sure. And I thought it, it's interesting because um, I think this discussion might be more than other discussions. We might have a lot of questions along the way. So if, if you have questions along the way, let's just do it. Uh, I envision this as me just starting to kind of chat about it and you going, well, Jim, what about this? What about this? Um, so let's do it that way. So I'm just going to dive in. <coughs> the first thing is, yeah, audio book Books are exploding. It has become, I think it's 1.3 billion with a B dollar industry now. And so it continues to grow. It's still the fastest growing uh, segment of the market. So it's something that you can't go, ah, I'm not sure I want to do audiobooks. At this point in your career, even if you have a first book coming out, you really need to consider audiobooks because Amazon is still the 900 pound gorilla in terms of distribution for your ebooks and your physical books, right? If you have an audiobook, they are more prone to promote your print book. So if you have an audiobook, it is going to promote your, your print book and your print book is going to promote your audiobook. So that's why it's become so important. But there are a lot of questions and a lot of options. And since it is an exploding is industry, it's a little bit of the Wild West. In other words, you have a lot of different companies coming up saying, hey, we can do this for you. We can do this for you. We can do this for you. So I think I, I'm so glad Melissa said, hey, let's talk about audiobooks and dispel some of the myths and some of the rumors. Um, the first thing you have to consider, uh, well, obviously, first you have to say, am I going to do an audiobook? <clears throat> but after that becomes the question of, do I do the audiobook myself or do I hire someone else to do it? Um, <clears throat> and that's really a question you have to answer yourself, but let me give you a little bit of perspective on it. <clears throat> if I said to you, hey, six months from now or three months from now, you've got to get up on stage at the local community play and be the leading actor in that play, how would you feel about that? Would you be nervous? Johnny's shaking her head going, not me. I am not getting up on stage and acting for, you know, three hours in the play. <clears throat> I'm just not comfortable doing that. I don't have the background for it. I don't have the temperament for it. It's just something that kind of scares me. Well, that's essentially what you're doing when you're getting behind a microphone and reading your own book. You are an actor. And so you are competing with other actors. Like I tell people when, uh, with regard to writing, people are like, why does it take me, why does it take so long to become a published author? I said, well, as I mentioned earlier, I play guitar and I could entertain you guys for about 20 minutes to half an hour. And you'd go away from that going, hey, Jim's pretty good, but you wouldn't spend money on my CD. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not that good. It would take a lot more work to get to that level. Well, it's the same thing with acting, right? You have to put in time to become an actor. You have to put in time to become a trained audiobook narrator. Uh, and, and the downside of doing fiction as opposed to nonfiction, if you're doing an audiobook that's fiction, you're doing one of your novels, you're not just the lead actor, you're all the supporting actors as well. So can you do those voices? Can you remember what that voice sounded like? On the other hand, the advantage of doing it yourself is huge because 
people love it when the author voices the book. <clears throat> And you know the nuances, you know the characters, you know where something should be emphasized and something should be muted a little bit. And so you can infuse those characters with a passion and a life and an energy that no one else can do. So those are the pros and the cons. Now I've painted kind of a grim picture of audiobook narration if you've never done it before, but you can learn it just like anything else. You can learn it and you can start practicing it. So some of you might, maybe you do your first books with somebody else. <clears throat> and then you start to learn it and you start to do it for yourself. There are so, and, the, and we live in the golden age of, of the internet where you can go online and you can Google in, uh, you know, how to become an audiobook narrator, how to become a voice talent and all of these resources. Yes, there are some you can pay for, but there's all these resources where you can learn to do it. So if you have a passion for it, um, if you have an enthusiasm for it, that's all you need. I, I believe you can make it happen. Now, my background is my degree is actually in broadcast journalism. I was on the air for a number of years. And so it was kind of in my blood. So when I made the transition, it was pretty easy. And I also took some acting classes in college. So I didn't go into it totally cold. And what happened is my publisher, <clears throat> excuse me, my publisher said, we're going to do an audio book. And I said, hey, can I try out? And they said, sure, read the first chapter and we'll let you know. And I read the first chapter and they said, yes, you can do it. So I, I did eight of my own novels. And then I started doing other people's novels, uh, author friends of mine. And so I've done about 20 other authors' novels at this point. And it's one of those things where I've discovered I just love doing it. I, I really, truly enjoy doing it. And so um, that gave me a little bit of a head start. So some of you probably have a little bit of that same type of background. Yeah, and even if you don't, I'm telling you, you can do it. I'm kind of going off topic here, but I think this is important. Um, I truly thought coming up in life, the talent was everything. Natural talent was everything. And what I've discovered, whether it's writing, whether it's audiobook production, whatever it is in life, cooking, I don't care. Talent is highly overrated. The thing that is going to bring success, however you define success, is perseverance. It's grit. Are you going to stick with it? And so if some of you right now are going, yeah, Jim, I'd love, golly, I have this secret desire. I'd love to do audiobooks, but I don't think I'm any good. I can't stand the sound of my voice, et cetera, et cetera. I'm telling you, don't let those lies keep you back. On the other hand, if you're going, oh my gosh, it's voicing it, it's editing it, it's finding the software, it's building a, a sound booth. I just don't want to do any of that. Then great. There are a lot of opportunities for you to have someone else do it. So um, why don't we pause there and see if there's any questions with regard to that? Oh, I see the chat is yeah, full, so maybe gone. there's some questions. Well, <laughs> one of the first questions was narrating your own audiobook. Is that a good idea or not? Idea or not? So you you know you've already touched on that. And then someone asked, who pays um, if you're traditionally published? Who pays for the audiobook? Yeah, no, that's a great question. If those of you who have, let's talk first about those of you who are maybe entering into a traditional contract or you want to enter into a tra traditionally published model, push for the audiobook. Because like I already said, audiobooks, they cross promote each other, right? And these days readers almost expect to have three versions of a book, the physical, the ebook, and the audiobook. And so consequently going into that contract, I would say we're doing an audiobook, aren't we? make it the assumptive thing. Uh, I assume if you're going traditionally published, you have an agent. And so I had to talk to your agent about that because if they are putting the money into an audio book, um, then it means they believe in the book. If they're hesitant, then it's kind of like, do you really believe in my book? So if you're traditionally published, I would push for that audio book. And the other thing is I would push in the contract for, and this is, it, it, oftentimes you don't get this, is I want approval on the narrator. And they won't necessarily like that, your traditional publisher, but I would push for that. You know how you have an idea of what the narrator is going to sound like in your mind. And so at least have them give you input on that so you can give your thoughts on that. Uh, what else with regard to, um, oh, in terms of who pays for it. So your publisher will pay for that. Uh, pays for the audiobook production whereas if you're in indie you pay for it 
same model as as the book you know they're going to pay for everything if you're traditionally published you're going to pay for it if you're indie uh, in my case so and this is what's nice if you're traditionally published and you say i really would love to read the book um i got paid my advance for the book and then i got paid as the narrator of the book so i got paid paid twice for that book so that was that was really nice there was a question about Audible, wanting to know um, what that is and um, how, how we can use that or if we should use that. Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And that's going to take us down um, <clears throat> a little bit further down the road. Do you think you, before you answer that, you could answer what kind of equipment you need to do audiobooks yourself? Sure. Yeah, let's talk about equipment. Um, your microphone is going to be your it's going to be your primary piece of equipment. Well, that and your audio software. Well, that and your booth. <laughs> it's all important. But um, like this is a, a Rode uh, NT1. I bought this as a kit. So I got, I got the microphone um, and I got the cord. Uh, I got the pop filter. So it was a kit and it was 269 bucks. So 270 bucks. So not that expensive. Uh, as most Te people technically say. that's a windscreen windscreen yeah nope. pop filter windscreen pop, no 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 there's a pop filter and a windscreen i have them backwards just just for clarification because you'll see us when you're looking for microphones that's a condenser microphone in particular it looks looks like i think yeah and then is. um a windscreen is the little um ball fuzzy thing that goes over it's like foam and then the pop filter is the thing that goes in front of it that prevents the the big, you know, noises on your mic. So Just this clarification is my... when you go hunting for a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Brandy, thank you. She's my editor, technical uh, advisor. <laughs> oh goodness, no! I just went looking for a microphone and got a little confused at first by all of the different specs on what you could buy for a microphone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're, exactly, and that's a point. There are so many microphones out there. So I use this one for podcasting now. But as I got serious about audiobook. Uh, production i bought a sure sm7b which is a really nice microphone and it's um it's 400 bucks but you can you should write down this website uh, it's sweetwater.com just sweetwater.com and and i've bought equipment from there and their service is just unbelievable they are the type of people where you could call them up and go okay i'm getting into audiobook narration i'm not sure where to go can we talk through options of microphones um and I looked recently and they've got this microphone, the Shure, which like I said, is uh, 400 bucks. I think they have it on sale for a hundred bucks off right now. So anyway, this is a, my Shure microphone is a really nice microphone to use. So, but again, YouTube is really going to be your friend in this where you can Google, how do I choose? How do I choose a microphone for narrating audiobooks? And you'll get a ton of information. So what I would encourage you to do is just do research, do a lot of research yourself. Uh, and a place like Sweetwater, even Amazon, but a place like Sweetwater, if it's not right, they're going to make it right. And so maybe you find this is a microphone I don't really like, they will exchange it. They're just a really good company to deal with from what I've seen. Um, so that's your microphone. Now let's talk about where do you record? You probably don't want to put the expense into building out you know, a studio until you find out if you really want to do this or not. And so a lot of people literally start out in a closet where they go to Amazon and they buy foam. You can go to Amazon, you know, type in audio foam, soundproofing, and you can buy pretty inexpensively foam that you can put on the inside of that closet. The other thing, depending on the size of your closet, if you have clothes in there, those are going to deaden the sound as well. So a closet can be a great place to start. And then you need your laptop, you need your microphone set up, um, and then the other thing is you're going to need a mixer. You, you don't want to just plug directly into your computer. You want to use a mixer. And again, I would, same thing. I, I bought from, I, I bought a mixer from Sweetwater, Focusrite. It's worked out really, really well for me. So again, Google mixers, talk to people at Sweetwater, those experts, they're there to help you out and find the equipment. The next thing you got to think about is your editing software. And there are myriad choices of editing software out there voices here's another resource for you to write down voices.com voices.com is not only a place where you can find talent 
to narrate your book. It's also a resource for just getting yourself educated on the industry. And while we're at it, I'll mention acx.com as well. ACX is going to teach you, uh, if you're doing it yourself, everything from equipment to editing, um, how to edit, some of the technical aspects, because before you submit a book to your distributor, you got to make sure your levels are right, that kind of thing. Again, acx.com is a great resource. Back to which software should you use if you're just starting out in audiobooks, I would highly recommend Audacity, audacity.com. It can look a little bit intimidating at first, but again, it's, it's, it's actually easier than you think. Once again, YouTube utor- tutorials are really helpful in this. The reason I recommend Audacity so highly is they have all the plugins you need to do everything you need to make your audio sound great. And the price is extremely reasonable, and that is it's free. So there's no cost for you to use Audacity. Um, some of the other more popular ones, Adobe is really popular. Um, trying to think what else. Yeah, Adobe Edition, Pro Tools. A lot of people swear by Pro Tools, like it's, you know, it's the cat's meow logic. Um, if you have a Mac, you can use GarageBand. Wow. to record so if you're familiar with garage band boom you're you've already got it you don't even have to download audacity for free <clears throat> so you've got that there a software i'm looking into right now is called hindenburg which is kind of new on the scene uh they're out of europe and but i've had a lot of people talk about how great that software is so hindenburg.com and they have various software they have software for journalists they have software for podcasters they have software for audiobook narrators. So they've got a variety of, of products to choose from. Um, Johnny, how was that for answering the question? That was a lot of great information. Okay, sorry, I probably went too fast, but that's why we're recording it, right? Um, all those uh, in the chat, all links to all of those um, different places that Jim mentioned so that you'll, you can access that. That's wonderful. What else do we have, gals? Um, again, going back to Audible, Somebody had asked about that. Right. Okay, great. So let's talk about the good news and the bad news about Audible. So Amazon owns Audible. Amazon also owns ACX. Now, Audible is an audiobook distribution channel. ACX is the production channel. So... If you say, Jim, I don't want to do my own book. I want somebody else to do it. You can go to ACX and you can find a narrator for your book. And then you have an arrangement with ACX and the narrator for costs, fees, distribution, all that. So let's talk about, so think about Audible, Amazon, and ACX as they're all, they're all the same. They're all, I mean, they're not, they're separate companies, but they're all owned by Amazon. So they work together. The advantage of working with ACX is you can go to ACX, you can find a narrator, you can work with the narrator right there. Um, They upload the files, Amazon grabs it, distributes distributes it to Audible. They send your payment. It's it's pretty seamless. It's, It's pretty nice to work with ACX. There's a great paper trail. They're accountable to the narrator, right? There's some checks and balances there. So ACX, those are the pros of working with ACX. Even if you're independent, if even if you're doing it yourself, you can work with ACX, or you can work with a narrator. Here's the downside: um, they want an exclusive with you, similar to what Amazon does with their eBooks. So they. And that exclusive can last seven years. And the reason they do it seven years is because most of a book sales will come within the first seven years and after that. So you have to ask yourself the question, do you want to limit yourself to Audible? Now, Audible has about 40% of the market. So they have a huge market share. The problem is, what about that other 60%? Now, Amazon will pay you 40% on your, your sales of your audiobook 
if you go wide, which is called wide distribution, and you want, no, I don't, I want it on Audible, but I want it other places as well, then Audible is going to pay you 25%. So you can see the choice there. Do I go with the big guy and make it one-stop shopping and get 40%? Or do I go wide, get 25%? Um, if we were having this conversation three years ago, I'd say, or even two years ago, I'd probably say, go with ACX, just do it. But because you have all these other companies growing up, everyone from Google's getting into it to Kobo to um, Chirp audiobooks, there are a lot of other places where you probably want your audiobook uh, distributed. And so by the time you take the 25% of the 40%, 25% royalties from the 40% of the market that Audible has, and then you add in all these other players, um, I think in the long term, you come out ahead by, by going wide with a wide distribution. It's so interesting how things change so fast. I mean, oh, so fast. Two years ago, this is what I would have said. That <clears throat> this is just like, you know, all, all I want to do is write. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, Johnny, you thought you were an author. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> no, you definitely are not. Or you are an author, but you're, you're so much more. Yeah, right. yeah, but I don't know um, how to my last contract to see what is the with traditional publishing, what is the typical royalty rate on an audiobook? Do you know what it might be? Cal, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think what I on mine. I think mine were the, mine was the same as my my print books. Um, I, I really don't know the answer to that question. I should know it, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> Indie published in the, you know, or, you know, whether you're going the 40% or the 25%, I was wondering if that's comparable to being traditionally published and having an audio book. So yeah, I think it's going to be lower. If you're traditionally published, I'm, I'm guessing your royalty rate is going to be uh, yeah. lower. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I actually don't know that. Um, yeah. Traditional publishing will, I'm, well, I'm, I guess they distribute them. I mean, I, I, I know I've got one up there <clears throat> on Amazon. I haven't looked to see if it's available other places too. I know it's an audible. I know it's available on audible though. And again, if you're traditionally published, they handle all that for you. Your agent negotiates your rate. And, and really, that's the nice thing about going traditional and having an agent. They, they take care of it. Um, but so many people are going indie these days. And even traditional, traditionally published authors are going indie. So um, it, I think it's something, even if you are traditionally published, it's something you need to know about. Right, right. <clears throat> well, and let's, I'm going to go back to the talent for a minute too. Like we talked about the equipment and how that might how much that could cost. Um, and if you do feel like you just don't have the voice for it, um, what are we talking about as far as hiring um, someone to narrate? And I guess you can do that. You can do that through one of these companies, but can you also kind of do that as a freelance thing on your own? So you're sort of blending it. You're doing part of it on your own part of it and using other people. Yeah, really good questions. So first, let's talk about the talent aspect of it. Like I said, you can learn to, I think anybody can learn. I mean, there's some people that just have voices where you just go, no, uh, it's not going to work. But most people, if they work at it, I, I think um, they can persevere and pull it off. But choosing the audio talent, if it's yourself, you're going to have to work on it if you haven't done it. If you or choosing somebody else, let's talk about that just for a minute, because I think it's critically important. I, I'm a big audiobook fan, right? Just, just as a fan, I love audiobooks and I love podcasts. If the person in a podcast has a bad voice, it really doesn't, it doesn't bother me that much. But on a book, a narrator makes or breaks a book for me. I am just like, I can be, okay, 10 minutes in, I can't do this. And so choosing your audio your narrator is really, really important in taking the time to do that. So some of you are probably going, yeah, Jim, but if I go with ACX, they just assign me a narrator. No, no. What happens is you put up a project, you put up a job, and then you have people try out for it. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest thing I think about audio is you can, you can test the waters. You can get 10 different reads on, you know, maybe it's your first two pages or you, you choose a section for them to read where you're getting some characters in there as well. 
And then you listen to those 10 and you go, nope, none of those are it. I'm, I'm going for somebody else. So you really get a chance to pick the narrator where you go, ah, that's the voice I was looking for. And, and the nice thing is these days, again, getting into audio narrating for 400 bucks, you know, you could be totally set up and ready to go. So it's not that expensive, which means a lot of people are getting into audiobook narrating, which means you have a lot more choices. Um, it's good that you have a lot more choices, but let me caution you, and this is probably obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, you're going to pay more for the better narrators because <laughs> it's not just narrating. It's, 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 it's acting, but it's also editing. It's knowing when to put in the pauses, where to tighten up as you go back and you edit this thing. And so, um, yeah, you're going to pay more for, you're going to pay more for the better editor of your book. You're going to pay more for a better narrator of your book. Um, but uh, there are a lot of talented narrators out there. And yes, Johnny, really good point. You don't have to go through ACX. For example, um, Susie Warren, Susan May Warren, a lot of you know Susie. And Susie uh, hired me to voice five books in her Marshall series, her Marshall Cowboy series. So I had five books to do. Well, she came directly to me. She didn't go through ACX. She said, hey, Jim, do you want to do these books? And Ted Decker hired me to do a book. Randy Ingermanson has hired me to do a book. I'm thinking, wow, I don't think <laughs> I don't think I've done any books through ACX. In other words, I've never tried out. Everyone's just come into to me. And then at that point, I'm just voicing the book for them, giving them the files. And then they decide, am I going to go through ACX? Am I going to go through Find A Way? How am I going to do it? So this is a really important point. You can find your narrator on your own. You don't, you don't have to use ACX um, or, or any, any place else. Well, you've got that good voice that, I mean, from your, you know, your years of radio, I suppose, helped to hone that, that you've got one of those natural voices. Well, it's fun some too. Some of this I... also brings out <clears throat> um, a point that if you want to do your own narration, I think you kind of have to have somebody else scream you to see how you sound because we sound different in our own ears. How do we really sound coming across in an audio book? So how do you do that? How do you, you ask a bunch of people, hey, how does this sound? Because you don't want to put something up that turns out to not sound as good as maybe you think it does. To be honest, tell me honestly what you <laughs> Right? <laughs> yes, yes. And that's where, <clears throat> that's where it's, worth paying to get some coaching if you're just starting out or at the very least send it to a friend just like you do with your books right we send it to critique group or our beta testers and go hey is this working jim no that scene's not working that character's not working okay thank you same thing with your audiobooks you've got to send it to people and see what they think <clears throat> but here here's here's another thing i would highly recommend and it's more money out but I think it's an essential. When I record a chapter of a book, I have an editor that I send it to. And so I will send the chapter and I think it's perfect, right? <laughs> and, and she'll write back to me and go, not enough emotion there. Um, too much emotion there. Uh, you rushed this. Uh, and she finds typos for me. Well, the manuscript says this, and you said this, you missed this word or you pronounced that word wrong. And I just, I don't, I, you know, just like in our books, you miss it. And so, yes, having an editor, and maybe it's just an editor that just reads it along, reads the manuscript along with listening to pick out mistakes. In my case, I have an editor that does give me direction, like I was just talking about, does give me coaching. Um, so for me, that works out really well. <clears throat> How many times then do you record the the manuscript do you record it then more than once like she sends it back to you and says you made these errors so you record it again no so really good question johnny so uh it might be one line so i go in and do what's known as a pickup line so i'll record that line and cut and paste basically take it stick it into the the original recording that's which again, I started out in the days where when I was on the air, you had a razor blade and tape that you'd cut. It's <laughs> like, I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they did it. Um, and nowadays, you know, it's just with the software, it's just so easy to cut and paste. <clears throat> oh, no. Someone asked about make... having three narrators, but you don't, you don't, you don't having three character main characters. So you need three narrators and that's not the case. Just one person. No. Makes... I mean, there are some productions that do multiple um, 
characters, narrators, but uh, the majority, the vast majority is the main narrator will be the narrator and be the characters as well. <clears throat> so then the question becomes, well, Jim, then how do you do female voices? <laughs> right? Right. <clears throat> and I say, well, I guess you'll just have to listen to one of my books to find out. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do, there's breathing techniques, there's production techniques, there, there's way you can do female voices. I, it was nice because Susie and I have this series, The True Lies of Rembrandt Stone coming out, uh, or it's coming out all this year. Some of you might be familiar with that. So we have a six book series that's coming out this year and four books have already released. And I'm, of course, doing all the audio for it. And I got, it was a really nice compliment. Melissa uh, Baker Parcell, some of you know her. She has a, a Life Fully Booked. She used to write book reviews for RT Book Reviews. Anyway, she reviewed the audio and she said, um, wow, Jim pulled off the female voice. And it wasn't, and I wasn't sure how he was going to do it, but it works. And so that's what you want to try to do. You want to try to get the reader so they don't, even think about the fact that it's a male doing a female voice or vice versa because there's some women great female narrators out there that have to do male voices so um <clears throat> you got yeah, a lot of people of... in the chat wanting to hear that female voice jim <laughs> 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 they want a little sample <laughs> okay okay i have a way to give you i think i have a way to give you a sample okay no i do i do so go to rembrandtstone.com <laughs> rembrandtstone.com go down to the bottom of the page and you can get the first chapter of the audiobook for free and you can hear me you it, it that it, actually that'd be a good exercise because you can you can hear me speaking now in this voice but you're going to see that i i have a different voice for the character of rembrandt stone and then i have different voices and cadences and pacing for the other characters and so and it's done in first person. Rembrandt Stone is a first person narrative. So it was really fun to become that character, right? I'm telling you the story as that person. So that's a way to hear the female voice. Great. Great. Thanks. Rembrandt Stone, that's, that's a pretty cool name. <laughs> yeah, Susie, Susie came up with that. I think it's brilliant. <clears throat> so back in the chat a little bit, we had some questions about what file format you use for the audio. <clears throat> for the audio recordings. <clears throat> yeah, so the way it works is, say you're recording in Audacity. <clears throat> Boy, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I'll just walk you through the process of how I do it. I record a chapter, and then what I do is I save it as a WAV file, because that's going to be the, the richest file. I'll send it to my editor as a WAV file. She'll download it into her audio software, do the edits, send it back as a WAV file. I take it <clears throat> into, a, into Audacity, do the corrections. <clears throat> then I export it as a WAV file. And then there's a program that converts it into the right format for MP3. So the short answer is it's MP3 files. That's what you end up um, producing and, and what people and what you load to upload to ACX, if that's going to be your distributor or find a way but it's essentially, it ends up becoming MP3 files, which most people are pretty familiar with. <clears throat> we also had a question about nonfiction on, oh, here it is. Uh, Cause you know, often we think about audiobooks as in fiction, but um, Catherine asked you nonfiction, how to illustrated books also have audio editions. So that's a really good question because there's a perception in the mind of most listeners. Um, it's kind of a treat if the author reads their own novel, but it's not that expected. With nonfiction, they almost expect the author to be the one narrating it. Because a lot of times, if you're doing nonfiction, you're probably a speaker. Uh, a lot of times you're a speaker. There are very few nonfiction that, that don't have the speaking going on too. And so they might be used to your <clears throat> voice on YouTube or talks you've given, that kind of thing. And so if you write nonfiction, I would really encourage you to try doing it yourself. It doesn't have to be. I've done a number of non, I've done probably five nonfiction books for people, but it is kind of weird when I'm saying I, as if I'm, I'm the author and I'm not. Um, but I did a book for Susie, right? Where... Um, 
a nonfiction book, a, a teaching, a craft book, the story equation. <clears throat> and a couple of times it's like, well, I'm not female. This is a little weird to be describing myself that way, my husband. But anyway, that's a long way of saying if you if you can, if you're willing to put in the work, I nonfiction is great when it's read by the author. And somebody asked if you do teen. <clears throat> Sorry, Johnny, what was that? Someone asked if you do teen voices. Yeah, sure. Sure, you do them all, right? You have to have a way because you're going to have kids in books. How do you make a kid? And you don't want to talk like this because that's stupid sounding. Yeah. So how do you do it? Well, yeah, so um, yeah, a good narrator is going to be able to do every character, right? They're going to be, they got to be able to do uh, older folks. They got to be able to do kids. You have to be immersed in that that experience. And there's some here, here's something interesting. It, those of you who listen to a lot of audiobooks, you'll notice this. There are some, not a lot, there are, but there are some <clears throat> that don't do much. They do, really don't do voices. They more do just slight changes in pacing or volume or emphasis. Like I read uh, Ready Player One, or I listened to Ready Player One. And Will Wheaton was the narrator. And I was surprised that he didn't know, do more distinct voices for each of the characters. And so that's another way to do books. It's just a stylistic thing. I like to do a distinctive character voice for each of the main characters. Uh, he didn't. And it still worked for me. I still loved the book. So <clears throat> That kind of makes me wonder a little bit about your process. So, so do you like read the whole book through first to get a flavor and to kind of get to know these characters before you choose? <clears throat> so yeah the way narrators um the way the typical narrator will do it is they'll read through the book some will read through the book and then go back and read it through a second time making notes and oh this character is going to sound like this or this character is going to sound like this i have a friend who read a book cold one time in other words just went in and started reading it and he got three quarters of the way through the book and it wasn't until then that it was described as the character having a southern drawl let's <laughs> whoops <laughs> gotta go back <clears throat> and he had to redo the whole thing so you definitely want to know your characters ahead of time and and what they're going to sound like so do a little yeah pre-prep and that's why audiobooks that's why to get a good narrator it's expensive i mean it's expensive to do it and i'll talk a little what, bit about what? I was going to say, what kind of price ranges we got going there? <laughs> yeah, you can get. And so here's how, here's how an audiobook is priced out. Uh, well, there's three different models. There's the royalty share model. Um, <laughs> and that is it costs you nothing, which is really nice, right? You don't pay anything for the audiobook, but you pay 50% royalties for the rest of your life with that narrator. And so it's like, oh, wow, if my book takes off, then I'm paying 50% to my narrator for the life of the book. <clears throat> um, or you can go per finished hour, where you contract with me and we decide on a per finished hour rate. So say we just for um, easy numbers, let's say it's $10 an hour for and it's not that <laughs> i'll talk a little bit more about what rates what rates you can expect to pay for an audiobook but just for the math because i'm bad at math you agree to pay me ten dollars an hour per finished hour so each finished hour of audiobook i get ten dollars now to get to that finished hour i've got a prep i have to read the book <clears throat> i have to edit the book i have to master the files so you're talking to get one hour of audio i'm sp probably spending three to four hours of work now if i can do it faster good for me but you're protected because it, it's like i don't care how long it takes you jim we've decided this is how much you're going to get per hour so that's one way that's another way to do it where i don't do the royalty share i want to keep all the money from the sale of this book <clears throat> okay great then i'm going to pay you per hour and whatever, how many hours it is times $10, right? If it's 10 hours, then I owe you $100. And then I'm free and clear. The third way to do it, which is interesting to me, is it's a hybrid model where you have a lower per finished hour rate. So now I'm doing it for $8 an hour. But I also get a, 
percentage of the of the sales of the book, maybe a lower percentage, maybe I'm getting 25% instead of 50%. And then I'm lowering my per finished hour a bit. <clears throat> so you have three models. Interesting. Somebody commented about the huge time commitment. I'm kind of curious, what is a roundabout time commitment that audio production, audiobook production takes? <clears throat> Yeah, it it's huge. So for example, right now I'm voicing the Rembrandt Stone books and I'm putting anywhere from 50 to 60 hours into each book. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of time. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why to get a, like I said before, to get a good audio book narrator, it does cost you something. Um, but, but <clears throat> it, with the models these days, you can do the royalty share. Here's the problem though. Here's the problem. Um, like when I was doing a book for Ted, I said, yeah, let's do the royalty share. 50%. Great. Well, he's smart enough to go, no, I'd rather pay your, your finished hour and then keep everything. Cause I know this is going to sell really well. Um, the people who are typically the people who are willing to do royalty share with you, the book's not going to sell that well. And so, you know, it's that, it's that, it's that balance. It's that balance. <clears throat> What was the, the finished hours then when you're saying you're putting like 50, 60 hours in it? And then what, about how long, how many hours is one of your books? Is the room? Yeah, so it's, say it's, um, and I'm including, I'm including promotion and I'm including some other, and I'm editing and some other stuff in that uh, of the manuscript when I get it. But uh, so the Rembrandt Stone books, I think are six, seven hours long. <clears throat> six hours, I think. So you can see it's 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 definitely a it's definitely a time commitment. Yeah, definitely. everybody's wanting to know the approximate rates that we might expect to pay if we were to hire. <laughs> yeah, you can pay. Uh, the range is anywhere from from a hundred dollars per finished hour to you know four hundred and fifty dollars per finished hour. Yeah. Um, and and then some of the really expensive uh, voice actors, you know, you'll pay five hundred dollars per finished hour. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of a range. The the after rate, uh, the union rate, where if you're a member, uh, you cannot accept a project for less than two hundred fifty dollars an hour. <clears throat> but again, you can go on Fiverr and you can go on ACX and you can go on all these people are up and coming and they want to establish their portfolio. So, um, you know, you might be able to get a good voice for one hundred fifty bucks an hour or two hundred dollars an hour. Yeah, uh, just be careful using Fiverr. There are a <clears throat> lot of people out there that aren't that great to hire on Fiverr. Exactly, exactly. And that's why, again, I go back to, Brandy makes a really good point. What's more important to you? Is it quality or is it saving money? Um, which is the, the case with a lot of things in life. But I just, because I'm so passionate about audiobook narration, um, I go back to the thing we talked about earlier that the narrator makes or breaks the book. So if I were you, I'd, pay a little bit more and get somebody that you know knows what they're doing and it can sound good and the other thing here's the other nice thing about audiobooks is you try out and you go ah jim sounds pretty good but all i got was two pages <clears throat> great go to audible and type in james l rubart and you got all these samples that you can listen to and go okay now i've listened to you know 10 different books by jim Yes, he is the guy. And you can do that with any narrator, right? That that isn't just starting out. And so you can get a what I love about audiobooks is you you get to pet the dog before you bring him home. <laughs> Great expression. <laughs> there was a lot of talk about um accents in the chat too. And and you know, like you brought up the southern draw. Well, I will say for one thing, that author should have had that in the very beginning. Of I thought that's I agree. I agree. Book, didn't find out till later. I was like, I've read this book wrong this whole time. Um, yeah, but you know, not even every Southern accent is the same, right? I mean, you all know. Right. <laughs> so do you practice accents? And, and you don't seem to have an accent yourself. I mean, I don't hear like a specific accent. Yeah, it's, it's funny. So uh, for years, you had a lot of the national voice talent in this country come out of the Pacific Northwest. Really? 
the reason being is because we don't they say we don't have accents up here um <laughs> uh, yeah it's isn't that interesting and and now um and and if you listen to a lot of the audiobook narrators they 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 have that neutral voice they don't have the accent either but as far as doing accents uh, again um I always wanted to act on my bucket list was to act in community theater, you know, at some point in my life, took acting classes in college. And so I definitely had a, uh, an interest. And so now I feel like I'm, I'm living the bucket list. I get to be an actor. The advantage is I don't have to worry about makeup or on stage or blocking or hitting my marks or anything. And if I make a mistake, I get to go back and do the line again, all that to say, Johnny, Yes, I come up against these accents, right? So with Susie's uh, Marshall, Montana Marshall series, it's like, oh my gosh, I got to do Russian accents. What the, what the heck, right? So I just, I learned them. And then with the Rembrandt Stone book, I had to learn a Somali accent. So I learned it. I, I had a, I recorded a guy with a Somali accent, put my cell phone down. And so I'm doing it and I'd play it to get it in my head. And, and you just off and go and you learn it. It's really fun. If you take the attitude of, wow, I'm going to learn something new. It's really fun to do. So. Cool. Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> did I miss any questions? Did, did we miss it? <clears throat> Brandy, did you um, see? Someone's wondering if you had a queue of people waiting to do their books. <laughs> um, waiting to have you do their books. Yeah. I think I know yeah. right. it's a good time. <laughs> no, I, well, I've got to finish up two more books and then I'm talking to Katie Gansher. Do you know guys know Katie? I know the name. Yeah. Yeah. So she's talking about me doing one of her books, but um, other than that, I'm open. So yeah, if you guys would love me to like me to try out for one of your books, I'd love to do it. Um, Cause after the next Rembrandt stone book, I don't have anything definite. So yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. All right. I love doing it. We can tell. I mean, your enthusiasm for this this whole topic it just just shines through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun. It's fun. Would you do a menopause book? I'm kind of teasing because that was just in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I think that might be better voiced by a female. <laughs> oh my goodness! All right. Well, listen. Um, <clears throat> Why don't we have everybody come back on for the last few minutes? And if we put you in jail, let us know and we will try to get you back out again. And while we're waiting for y'all to do that, Jim, is there anything that we didn't ask that maybe we should have or that you, anything else you want to talk, uh, tell us about entering? Yeah, let me just, let me look. I made some notes before we got together, things I wanted to make sure we <clears throat> covered. So um, see if there's anything major that I missed. Oh, someone did ask early on, do libraries sometimes have soundproof rooms that you can um, I don't know, maybe use for free? I guess you would just have to check with your, with your own libraries to see if that was possible. I never even yeah. knew libraries had such a thing. <laughs> I don't know either. I don't Until know. Until I have a small town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, I have to. Yeah, check. I don't know. That it'd be it'd be hard because you'd have to pull in all your equipment. It'd take a. It, it might be fairly cumbersome to do that. Um, and and here's the thing about. So, <clears throat> my studio is in the basement of the house next door because that's owned by my brother-in-law, and my father-in-law, and so they are rarely here. Yeah. So that's where I have my studio. I have to turn off the refrigerator running upstairs because the sound bleeds through through my microphone. So in other words, what I'm saying is a library probably wouldn't have it because you would be amazed at the sound, right? You have a helicopter going overhead or an airplane. Well, got to stop recording or at least pause. And so um, I don't think a library would be in your best interest because people would be making noise. <laughs> Reminds me of our audiologist booth. They're so yeah. soundproof that no sound gets in or out. It makes me wonder, hmm, maybe I could rent that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. I like that. 
We're like that. That professional here at Writers Chat. We just <laughs> whatever gets recorded, that's it. It goes out. <laughs> I like it. Oh, I should give you my email address if anyone is interested in in chatting about um, doing some narration for you. Just James L Rubart at gmail.com. But as most of you probably know, I go by Jim. So, but James L Rubart at gmail.com. Rhonda, you have a question? I do. It's not about audiobooks. I'd like just two or three minutes about your writing academy oh. and what that's like and uh, how you find out more information about it. Great question. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I, I just realized Lisa Lorraine Baker is in the house. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. So, um, yeah, Lisa's actually, looks like she's going to be coming. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. You? Happy anniversary. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. Um, and you can talk to Lisa because she and I have been doing some one-on-one -on -one consulting and it looks like she might be coming to uh, an academy next year. So thumbs up. So yeah, so the academy, uh, I'll tell you the quick story on it. Taylor, my son said, this was back in 2016. He said, dad, you love teaching and you do it all over the country. Why have you never done your own thing where you can really get one-on-one -on -one with people and really help them in a small, intimate setting? And I said, I don't know. You should do that. You should have like a retreat, right? Where people can get, come and learn how to do what you did. So I looked at him, I said, okay, Taylor, uh, if you help me with it, I'll do it. And he says, okay, let's do it. And so that's how the thing was born. And so we, um, we dove in and it has been incredibly rewarding because it's, it's everything that I've done to get to where I was in my career. But even more than that, it's, <clears throat> it's, I wish I had this when I was starting out and I wish I had this. And I even wish I had this after five books. And so Essentially, we've created an academy where you can you can learn everything you need to know. Um, everything from the craft to the marketing, the branding, the motivation, the inspiration, the business side. And then probably the thing that people absolutely um, lights them up is the first night we do what we call discovering the theme of your life. Because most people cannot tell you what the theme of their life is. But once you know that, once you understand the theme of your life, oh my gosh, e e then everything becomes clear. Everything you do is going towards that theme. It's just, and so anyway, we start with that. Then the next day we do craft, then we do marketing and branding, then we do motivation and inspiration, how to keep going. So anyway, that's kind of the, the structure of it. Um, and it's a four day retreat. We start on Thursday afternoon. We end Sunday, um, late morning and, uh, and then, and then I guess the other thing that we, we've done with this that people have really loved is, you know, a lot of conferences, you go away with a lot of information, but it's like, okay, what do I do with it? <clears throat> and so at the very end, um, well, what we do, we, we don't send it right away. It takes us about a week to put it together, but we send everybody an individualized roadmap for them, customized for them. What should you be doing for the next year to get your career to where you want it to be? And, and so it's not just go home and try, what am I supposed to do? You've got, okay, this is what I need to do. Customized to me. And so that's been, I think, really valuable to people. So anyway, that's the Academy. We have two coming up um, this October. No, October 21st through the 24th and then November 11th through the 14th. So we have two this fall. Can you keep them very small? Or did you say that already? Like, yeah. Oh, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Johnny. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I love conferences, right? Um, I do, but you can't get that intimacy and that safety of being around people and that sense of community in a big hotel where, you know, there's a hundred other people. And so we limit it um, to nine people. So that way you really are in a space where it's safe. We hold it in homes, not hotels. Cause again, much more intimate being in a home than a hotel room, you know, conference room, if that makes sense. Um, and we keep it small because everyone gets one-on-one -on -one time with both me and Taylor. Um, and you can't do that with too many people. So yeah, we've, we've loved doing them. We've loved doing them. 
So I think that's on some people's buckets list. Buckets, it's how do you say? Lists. Bucket lists. <laughs> Bucket lists. Buckets lists. <laughs> Bucket list. Some people's yeah. pocket lists. <laughs> so if you um if you want more info on that, just again email me at James L at gmail.com and I can give you some more some more details. Do so these so. have some openings for these two that are coming up then? Yeah, we do. I think we have I think we're um I think we're at five on one and six at a, on another so there are there are a few more spots yeah <clears throat> at this point and the cool thing is we get people flying in from all over the country so it's really a chance to connect and and i say this so if you come to the academy you'll hear this again but what i say is it's not about the writing everyone thinks they're coming for a writing retreat and Lisa is nodding her head because she, you know, she's gone through one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. The writing is only the conduit to free you up, to drive you deeper into Jesus, to, to throw off the shackles of your life so you can truly step into your destiny. And that's mm -hmm. as much as I love writing, I'm more about your heart than your writing. I want to see you set free in every area of your life. And this one gal, she came, she says, boy, the teachings was great and everything, but I didn't realize this, this academy was going to be soul surgery. And I said, <laughs> oh. and that just made me so happy because she, the person she came in as, and the person she left as very different person. And that's what I'm all about. You know, that's the theme of my life is I want you to be more free after you've had any kind of interaction with me. And so I want people walking away with the Academy. Yes. Now I know how to succeed in publishing, but even more than that, I want them to walk away going, I am so, I never expected to walk away this free and this clear on who I am inside. So I know my identity, like I've never known it before. And now I can step out, not just in writing challenges, but challenges every part of my life. So sorry, I'm, I'm waxing on, but I'm, <laughs> I'm passionate about it. So. Do you have a remote option? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, kind of. So the remote option is we have an online version where you can, you can go through the online version of the Academy and it's, it's powerful. I mean, Lisa has gone through the online version. Um, the reason I seem a little hesitant about the online version, it's a great alternative if you can't travel or you can't, um, it, the investment is too much. Um, but you don't get the, the thing you don't get on the online is the one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, well, so then do you offer one-on-one -on -one coaching remotely? Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah. Okay. So at least I can we, see there's probably a lot of people <clears throat> that would be interested in that kind of coaching, but maybe because of the pandemic or health reasons or whatever, yeah. they are just not <laughs> able to come in person. Yeah. And that's exactly what Lisa did. She did the online version. Um, and then uh, we've done one-on-one -on -one coaching. And the nice thing is, I'm spoiling my marketing pitch here, but I'll just tell you, uh, <laughs> if you do the online version and you want to come to the live academy after doing the online version, we've had a number of people do this, you take off the price of the online and you apply it to the, the live so you don't have to pay twice. You get a big chunk taken off when you come to the live academy, so... So it's a way for people to try it. And so that option is there. Right. Well, we're getting to the top of the hour. Yvonne, I'll take one last question. Get it. Is the online version the same number of days as the live one? Well, no, because yes. the online is go at your own pace. You do, you can, you know, you can make okay. a month to do it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's self-directed. Okay. All right. Well, Jim, thank you. This was just wonderful information. It's always good to have your expertise. And thanks for telling us about the Academy. I will say to you, I've heard Jim speak at workshops. I've gone through a, a quick marketing thing with him too. And it's just wonderful. And he can tell you your theme by asking one simple question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll say that for the after party. Okay. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh, I forgot to check what we're doing next week. Melissa, do you know? <laughs> we're going to do an open mic uh, write-in on uh, showing versus telling. 
Okay, Brandy, are you in charge of that? Yep. <laughs> Want to tell us anything to get ready for it? <laughs> um, well, we're just going to look at the differences between showing and telling, and then also active and passive writing, which you know a lot of us are familiar with. But then we're also going to put our um, writing to action by turning some of the passive and the telling prompts into active and showing writing. So we'll be doing some, basically a workshop. Very hands-on. Yeah, that's yep. great. All right. Well, Jim, thanks again. Thank you for everyone for being here. If you're watching the replay, we invite you to join us any Tuesday morning. We're here almost every single Tuesday morning, except around the holiday, um, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock Eastern. And you're invited to join our writer's chat group as well. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.